Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 163, I chat with video consultant Josh Kyroth about what he saw at the Infocom trade show and his thoughts on 4K. Coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded June 17th, 2013, episode 163. To 4K or not to 4K? This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Man Packs, manly goods on a schedule. Get started today and have underwear, socks, toiletries, shaving supplies, and more delivered to your door. Visit manpacks.com slash twit and get $10 off your first order of $30 or more or buy a $50 gift card for 40 bucks. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the home theater geek and director of content at avsforum.com. This week's guest geek is Josh Kyroff, a video industry consultant just returned from the Infocom trade show in Orlando, Florida. So I'm sure he's had plenty of exposure to the mouse. Hey, Josh, welcome back to the show. Howdy. <laughs> I, I, sh I should have brought my tag. I had Mickey Mouse on my Infocom tag. That was kind of... Oh, did they have that on, their, on the name badges? Uh, mine did. <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what the heck? You're in What Orlando. the heck? Yeah, right. Now, listen, before we get started, I want to make sure everybody knows those who are tuned into the live stream at live.twit.tv can, um, or that are logged into the chat room at irc.twit.tv can post questions for Josh and me, and uh, I will pass along as many as I can. So before we get started, I really must uh, point everyone, point out to everyone that uh, you're wearing the coolest suit I have ever seen. Check that out, man. That is the test pattern suit. Let's give us a quick look here. Look at that. Oh, my God. I've got to get one of those. It's, it's even on the tie. Jeez, you got all dressed up for home theater geeks in the most appropriate way I could possibly imagine. Did, did, did you just get that suit? Actually, it arrived today. <laughs> <laughs> so this I, is its first appearance. I, absolutely. It was supposed to be, um, I wanted it to get a little earlier so I could bring it to Orlando, but that just didn't work. Oh, darn. Well, I, I am thrilled that you are debuting this suit here on my show. <laughs> okay, Absolutely. so so listen, um, give us a little sense of what Infocom is. This is a trade show that, that you just came back from uh, last week, and uh, what sorts of things are there? Why were you there? What's important about it? The way I kind of I think about Infocom, the way I explain it is in the CDA market, it tends to be lower volumes with higher margins put together by professionals for solutions for customers. And in the Infocom, it tends to be higher volumes, lower marginals of equipment put together by professionals for projects for customers. So the two markets are kind of similar. They just take different ends of, of the using equipment, talent, understanding, experience to provide a solution. Hmm. I've always thought that Infocom, though, was more aimed at, at professional users of video equipment, like, for example, content creators, uh, broadcasters, that sort of thing, whereas Cedia is aimed more at the equipment that installers would be recommending and installing in consumer environments. Mm. If you think about a NAB, CES, Cedia, Infocom, and try to yeah. cause a corollary that they all can find comfortable houses in, mm -hmm. that's where I kind of look at Infocom and Cedia as being very similar in the customer base. People with experience using equipment for a solution. And the markets get segmented by what the goals are of the person. I mean, everyone wants to see or hear quality, but sometimes the quality is what they visually see or overcoming an obstacle or overcoming a budget. Um, I mean, putting a home theater in a boat has a lot of weirdnesses to it. Putting yeah, a projection system in a church with glass windows has got a lot of weirdnesses in it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's similar industries, 
But the thing that I, I, way I focus on it is whether or not, what the people use as tools and what their goals are, because the customers just want solutions. Well, that's true enough. Uh, and, and we're all customers and we all want solutions. Although yeah. I must admit, I have a, tr I have a, I don't know, maybe it's just a prejudice against, I, so many business people use this, this business speak of solutions instead of products or whatever. And I always find that to be a little, I don't know, <laughs> removed uh, from reality. Those who can do, do. Those who can't teach, those who True. can't teach, teach Jim. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's where within the process. Um, all right, yeah. all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, 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 Infocom uh, and NSCA, which was kind of combined to it, they're wonderful shows because people there generally are somewhat detached from the projects they want. They were told, we want this. So you got to do even more inquiring as to what's really going on. Whereas in a home theater, the person who wants it is incredibly vocal and incredibly present with every aspect of it. Right. Uh, but it's, it, it, it's attention. I mean, it's, it's actually, it comes down to the same. Know your equipment, know how it works know what people like, know how to make things happen. Mm -hmm. Don't screw And know up. what's going to work best in any given situation, given the parameters. Yeah, know when to ignore marketing, all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, I didn't say it that way. No, 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 no you, I'm no, sure no. you did. <laughs> I didn't hear you say that. Uh, <laughs> so give us, a, give us a sense of what you saw there that was new and exciting. Uh, in particular, I was intrigued. I got, you know, emails about things, uh, summaries and stuff, and... One of the interesting things I saw was that that direct LED displays yeah. are are becoming pretty interesting. And now, first of all, before you before you tell me that, I want to I want to make sure everybody understands. We've heard this term and seen this term LED TVs for a long time, and I think I've always thought that was a bit of a misnomer because it implies that what you're looking at is LEDs as the imaging. Uh, technology, similar to the jumbotron at the baseball stadium or the Fremont Street experience in Las Vegas, where they actually have arrays of real LEDs that are producing the image. But the LED TV, as we know it typically, is just an LCD TV with an LED backlight. But that's not what we're talking, not what we saw, what you saw at uh, Infocom this year. You actually saw real LED displays in which the LEDs are the imaging device, yes, and they're and they're getting small enough that they can actually produce a reasonable picture. Yes, at a whole bunch of levels, um, it's a balance of what is what the size is, the pitch, the manufacturing, the removing of obstacles of, um, of of artifacts, the colorimetry, and when you put a bunch of dissimilar things, whether they be video wall displays or LEDs or tiles in a pool, the odd ones will stand out. So you have to be able to make them all appear con contiguous enough that you can say, wow, it's one big thing. What I saw there, at least from my experience, is the first time I went, wow, I could watch that. It was good. And I've seen high quality, but I've always been able to discern some little aspect like, wow, that'd be great on a building. Or wow, that'd be wonderful right. if I had to look down the throat of the sun to see it. But <laughs> I saw 1.9 millimeter that at about eh, 18, 20 feet was very watchable, very smooth. Um, no more artifacts than I've seen in general video presentation. I mean, could it get better? Of course. But this was like, it's like that moment where you saw plasma and went, wow, it's not a computer monitor. I could watch this. Mm -hmm. Could watch a movie on it, in other words. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And its size with a high resolution signal, we were watching some 4K there, was engulfing. And it was really nice. Yeah. Dr. T in the chat room is asking, are they RGB LEDs or the three colors? Are they still used or is it something else? Um, I believe for that one, uh, again, this is from what I observed. I didn't ask that question. Um, I should have actually. It appeared to be individual clusters. I saw more than three elements. So for brightness, I'm sure they're doing some sort of, of a primary secondary mixing or multiple green primaries. There's a lot of topologies there. Mm -hmm. um, what I was impressed with is that it was being shown. There were interesting comparisons of cost on it. But in the application, the technology was irrelevant. It didn't matter. Once you couldn't see the pixels, 
they were really, it, the picture was good. Blacks were nice, colors were good, motion was good. Um, I've seen non-direct view LEDs, <laughs> projection devices that haven't looked that good. Hmm. Uh, the, now the price, I did a little quick calculation. And if you figure you got a pretty good quality 50, 60 inch display, you're going, okay, I'm, I'm prepared for somewhere in the mm, two to six grand range. The price per meter of high quality LED, well, a, a small pitch, is somewhere between 20 and 200 times per meter. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah, we're, we're, we're kind of, I don't think it was going to run out right now. Yeah. But it caught my, it caught my radar. I was like, wow, okay. It's not just for big buildings in Vegas anymore. Right. That was another example of, of LED display, direct LED displays that I wanted to mention, aside from the Fremont Street experience in Vegas, yeah. is all those signs outside of all the big hotels are all LED displays. But you're looking at them from hundreds, tens or hundreds of feet away. Yeah. And they, they aren't meant to be, you know, super high quality. They're just meant to be really bright. Well, for a long time, we had to use mediums because they were the only things that could do something, whether it was brightness or size or resolution or colorimetry or, you know, physical characteristics. Um, now, these LEDs that I'm seeing are saying, well, I don't have to choose one particular. I have options, mm. pros and cons. Um, free now, this? Street, Sorry, go ahead. Fremont Street is one of the coolest things ever. I mean, that the I agree. The, three and a half block long, free, gigantic visual explosion of enjoyment in Vegas. Yep. Um, and it really works. It's the right medium, the right environment. Put that somewhere else, eh, not so much. And that's yeah. how LEDs have kind of been. You know, wrong environment, eh, not so much. Right. This one right. was pretty cool. Now, when, when, when we talk about, when we characterize this, these displays that you saw as 1.9 millimeter, what, what dimension is that? What is it measuring? So as I took it, as I used my finger and the references I could, that would be center to center of what they're calling the picture elements, which I'm not quite sure whether that's a cluster of the RGB, as the gentleman had asked, or whether they're using it for resolution increases by putting more primaries or more green within one. But the space to space, the DPI in the print world. Ah. Um, and what I was looking at, I'm going, yeah, it's about a little under 2 million, 1.9 million. That's about right. Mm -hmm. For the spacing in between. Um, and how big and was the screen? Uh, it was, I would say, 10, 11 feet high, 10 to 11, and probably 20, probably 14 feet high by about 25 wide. That's wow. That would be my memory guess. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, and yeah, somebody, somebody, Alex C in the chat room is saying so the benefit of this is size? Application. An option. Mm. Um, benefit is based on what you care about. I mean, uh, sure if, if, if you have more money than you care about and you really want to push a bigger piano down the staircase of your boat, make the boat wider. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, <laughs> we don't all have these problems. So if you're in, a, uh, for this application, say you were using it in Manhattan where you have a high traffic area, you could place a display like this at street level have people both outside of the window and across the street all see an incredible vibrant image in daytime or night. Mm. Whereas if you used um, a video wall or you used an LCD or a direct view or a projector, the environment's change of light from day to night would cause all kinds of anomalies that would affect the quality. Mm. Mm. So it's a cost premium, but that's why they have them in the streets of Vegas because they want you to see that night or day and come by, you know, the, the shrimp buffet. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, um, and so you saw, you thought it looked uh, pretty darn good. They were showing clips of real yeah. video or movies or whatever. Yeah, I thought it looked very good. I mean, it, uh, when I say very good, it looked good as a technology, but I was watching, I was going, wow, that's a pretty cool picture. I believe it was, uh, there was some stuff from Prague. I'm going, wow, hmm, I kind of, that's looking nice. Mm. And when you can catch little bits of, you know, editing error or quantization error, that's pretty good on a direct view LED when you can go, mm, yeah, okay, they had a problem with this one. Right. Right. Uh, right. Is it going to be backyard TV? Mm, I'm not betting on that in the near term. But it at, least, at least except for people with more money than cents. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, exactly. <laughs> more dollars than cents. Um, the, right. What would an application be? 
if I was going to do a big drive-in movie screen, I would consider using that in the right environment for the right demographic. And you wanted to put, you know, not projection for a drive-in, but this could work. You get a good picture. Yeah. Of course, there are only, what, four or five drive-ins left in the country and probably yeah. don't have the money to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but okay, so um, that wouldn't be a good business model then. No, no, uh, no. But it would be a good application. Yeah. It, what made this impressive is usually with a direct view, you have to be, oh, uh, for like a four millimeter pitch, you got to be a good 40 feet before the picture is the picture and you're not seeing a bunch of dots. Right. And in this one, at 18 feet, I was really liking it. 16, 18, 16, I was beginning to see a little, but even that I wasn't, it wasn't taking away from my enjoyment. Mm -hmm, so it mm -hmm. was good. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so what else, what else did you see at the show that impressed you? Well, one of the things that impressed me an enormous amount there was not a particular technology, but the fact that people were showing technologies and showing them appropriately. So there seemed to be a little bit of an uptick in how manufacturers were addressing the market and addressing the potential for business. And they were approaching it with a lot of respect and with faith and with um, uh, belief, which is good. You know, un unlike a show that you go to and you say, oh, uh, what's going to happen next year because we're not sure what's happening? I'm seeing an, an increase of interest from both people attending and people exhibiting and people presenting information there. So I think the channel's fairly healthy, which is good for all of us. Which is really good for all of us. I couldn't agree more. Um, yeah, we don't. We don't want a, a, another Comdex. <laughs> no, we don't. Um, I'll be. I'll be learning more about that uh, next week. It's all, only next week already. When I go to the CE Line shows in New York City, uh, uh, which is sponsored by Consumer Electronics Association, uh, where I'm sure Gary Shapiro and others will uh, talk about the health of the industry. And, of course, they're promoters, so they're going to say it's really healthy. But here's some more uh, independent data to maybe uh, support that assertion. And the industries are, are tied together because what is – you can't make one without the other. The volumes of consumer allow the technologies to be used in professional. You know, the volumes of broadcast and those broadcast investments filter back into consumer and into professional. Um, it's kind of all related. So you pull one away, and it changes the dynamic of the balance. Right. Um, one of the other things that uh, that came across my desk was, uh, and I think you mentioned this to me in one of your emails, uh, that large LED or LCD displays might in fact be able to supplant projection, that the cost yes. is coming down, the oh, size yeah. is going up. Is that really true? Yep, yep. absolutely. And that's going to actually have some, um, I think, very beneficial ramification in ways that aren't necessarily anticipated. In a typical home theater installation, you're watching videos and movies and maybe some computer from a fantasy football or a video game would be probably the closest to a, a real data centric feed. As the displays get better and better and capable of handling higher uh, brightness levels, the idea of repurposing a room, not just as look what this is, but maybe I will bring my computer in here and use its photo stuff to show my pictures. Or I'm kind of tired. I'm just going to proofread this PowerPoint on the couch. Um, the line between what we used to think of as projector only and size and application and direct view only size application are really merging. Uh, touch screens are also changing that again. So if you can take a 80 inch projection environment, put a direct view 70 to 80 inch monitor that can handle dark and light and, and, and uh, bright lights environments, add a touch layer to that. Now that room kind of doesn't really get defined as a business -y center. It could be a video -y center. It could be a collaboration center. It's a room with a data wall. And, and I think we're going to see people enabling their home, their home and their entertainment environments are going to become more converged as the technologies that we use converge them too. Yeah, I mean, Vizio, Vizio just introduced an 80-inch uh, LED LCD TV for like 4000 bucks. Yeah, and there's, um, there's a, a, an off-brand, an off-named brand, 50-inch uh, that's 4K at substantially less than that with yes. its own series of issues and problems. Mm -hmm. But at some point you're going, mm, 
okay, how many pixels for how much? And uh, this is interesting. Yes, we live in interesting times, as the uh, old Chinese curse goes. <laughs> I mean, I still have my wonderful Kuro. That's a 720p, and I'm not giving it up because I love it. It makes a great picture. I know the distances, and I appreciate what it does. Resolution is not what you see. You see contrast, and you see artifacts. So if you right. can't see the pixels, you don't need more. But if you can represent them nicely, ah, oh, you got a great experience. Well, but that also, actually you go far 4K, you add another whole realm. It's like, damn, that's a lot of real estate. Well, we're going to talk about 4K yep. in a in a minute because there's a lot I know you have to say about it. Um, but I also, well, in fact, what the heck? Let's uh, let's let's go there. There's, there's a couple other things I wanted to, to ask you about from Infocom, but 4K sure, okay. must have been must have been all over the place. Um, it actually, I was expecting more. I was expecting a lot more gratuitous 4K. Uh, no, really? Even last year, we had a lot more gratuitous 3D. You know, something easy to spell and easy to promote. <laughs> uh, this year, there was some, th oh, yeah, very minor amount of 3D, uh, mostly in the digital signage kind of world. Um, but 4K was kind of held in check a bit. You know, Christy was showing 4K projectors. Um, collaboration environments, uh, Datatons Watch Out were showing high resolutions. Immersive was showing stuff. We were seeing scalar companies, big up to scalar companies uh, like Analog Way, uh, TV One, uh, Kramer, Christie Spider. They're moving pixels and they're allowing lots of things to come in and make a collaborative canvas. And how that's used right now is in the domain of you know business professional presentation, staging. But that's all going to filter right down into the consumer markets too. You know, when you so, get a lot of resolution on your display, you might want to do more than just watch one picture coming from one feed. It may want to be presented in ways that you can get relevance to it. Well, this this then is the question, isn't it? To 4K or not to 4K? <laughs> I've heard that somewhere before. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I have to tell everybody that you fed me that line, and it's a great line, so I'm going to use it. <laughs> so the, uh, the other one with 4K, um, 4K, as I said, is, is the, it's the convergence of can't get there in here because we're making the physical displays and we're making the cable connections that can deal with it. But whether it's the content side or the interfacing, switching, distributing, working with equipment, the roadblock now is not the physical or the camera or the graphic card or necessarily the cable. It's how it all works together. And that's going to be an interesting thing to have solved because it's not an update. We're dealing with some fundamental limits of what you can do. Well, right. But, I mean, we don't have the cable yet, do we? I mean, we do up to 24 frames per second, up to 30 frames per second, actually. Uh, and, but not but not 60. We, we need HDMI 2.0 or DisplayPort or something like that to, to convey 60 frames per second at 4K, do we not? And why do we need 60 again? <laughs> <laughs> where, 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 where do we get that idea that we need? Okay, okay so the camera's shooting at 24, and right. it's in a solid real form of progressive. Okay, so it's moving along, and the displays do what they do. Like in projectors, you know, 48 hertz, the shutter moving twice. Why is it better to push bits down a cable you don't need? Well, that's a very good question. So the thing about 4K is if you look at the bandwidth scope, to get high physical resolution, high bit depth, and high refresh, you can't get there from here. You can't have all of them mm. in what hope you can have. There are ways to get it. But you can't just assume that an adapter or an update or a widget or wave a chicken over your head or something is going to make it work. <laughs> you reach this level where the bits and the refresh and the resolution exceed what you can do. So you got to kind of go, well, do I really need 60? Can I work with 24? Do I really need 10 bits? I probably do. So I would say that might be even more important. Mm, I totally agree. As dynamic range of, of imaging sources are getting better and better, and as our tolerance for failure is getting less and less, yeah. you look at an iPad. That's a pretty cool little display. 
I'm not going back to some piece of poop little thing I had with a DVD player five years ago that was like, ugh. <laughs> so 4K is, uh, I think, the thing to kind of that I'm, I'm seeing us not understand as an industries um, is that there are two types of 4K. There's the 4K of video or digital cinema or capturing. And then there's the 4K of real estate. And they can converge, but they're very different in what they do. And 4K. What do you mean by the, what do you mean by the 4K of real estate? Well, when you have a 4K desktop, you've got this really big desktop. You've got 5,000 pixels from the start button to the stop button, which makes your mouse pretty useless. Um, you have the ability to see it, a large scope and to move with your eyes very quickly and gleam information faster than moving between monitors. Um, I can put up uh, about 160 PowerPoint slides and sort them incredibly fast much faster than scrolling or going between monitors. Um, you look at a map. I mean, anyone who tried mapping on their iP iPhone and then went to an iPad and went, wow, the map's useful. Hmm. Same data, just more real estate. I got gotcha. you. I got a couple. I'm sorry. You go, go ahead. Finish your thought. No, and, and that understanding of the 4K aspect, the word, we all, from our industries, we approach it thinking, okay, 4K is what I think it is as I know it. But we all kind of got to think, okay, is this 4K real estate? Is it 4K content? Is it 4K display? What is this 4K? Well, that's a very good point. Uh, and certainly you, you mentioned the word content, and that becomes a real issue as well. Because even though we're now starting to be able to buy 4K displays from mm -hmm. Sony and Samsung and so on, what are we playing on them? Okay, so last night I was over at my girlfriend's house watching a, 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 a show on, on uh, Showtime. Good quality show. I know it to have high production values. And her and her friend turned to me and said, is that in high def? <laughs> so I hit the display and it was getting 1080. And mm -hmm. the logo said high def. But, you know, it really wasn't so good high def. Hmm. Even though you knew the production value was good and the, the source was, was okay. Right. So the problem was somewhere in between, for some reason, the package wasn't completely delivered. Right. Yet we all accept it. And what's the tolerance? And where do we say enough? Stop. With 4K, I mean, I can take high production 2K content that's been managed well and, and then make it into 4K signals that you'll go, wow, that's so much better than 1080. That's great. Like by, by up conversion, you mean? Oh, sure. Yes. And by not having problems in the beginning. Um, you know, uh, Pink Floyd, okay? It was done on analog. Dark Side of the Moon. Great yep. album. Just because it was analog. I mean, they knew what they were doing. They paid attention to the principles and they made a really good piece of, of content. So it's easy to get lost in the technology. It's easy to think that a higher megapixel camera makes you a better photographer. No, dummy, it's the lens. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy hitting the uh, guy or gal hitting the uh, shutter button there, huh? Yep. Yep. Um, got a couple people in the chat room um, who are sort of saying, oh, I don't know, 24 is uh, a little a little slow, getting a little unhappy with that. Um, uh, and NH, they're talking about NHK in Japan, which is uh, now working, starting to experiment with 4K and even 8K. Uh, uh, it's a, and Beatmaster says NHK needs 50 hertz for their 4K, 8K stuff. No? So those are all very valid statements, but without defining what it is in that path of information and flow, they're kind of hard to, to debate or to agree with or to understand. Mm. If we have film and we shoot 24 frames a second, okay, I can show it at 120 frames a second. Why am I showing higher rates? What am I overcoming? Do I need 60 or 72 or 120 or 15? Or what, what frame rate do I need for the effect I'm going for, for the representation I'm, I'm trying for? And that has a lot to do with what our goals are, our environment, uh, our scope of view. I mean, the brighter something is, the dimmer something is. So to make arbitrary statements about frame rates without understanding what's supposed to be happening it's kind of a little, it's not necessarily wrong. It's just, just taking the easy way out. Well, it's incomplete, shall we say. Ah, uh, yes, much better. Okay. 
<laughs> journalists too. Those words, they just blow out of everywhere. Yeah, well, you know. So in other words, what you're saying is context is everything. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's, there's a, a movie, uh, the, the, the Mighty Powerful Oz. I was looking at it on the plane last night. Yeah. Oh, the Great and Powerful Oz. Yeah, yeah, this new one, right. And I didn't notice it was black and white until it went to color when he hits Oz. Ah, interesting. Which they did, of course, to mimic the original uh, Wizard of Oz. But the second time I saw it, it got me again. You didn't even notice? Well, I noticed it going to color, but I'd seen it twice, two different flights, and I'm going, oh, that's cool, they did the color gag. Right, and then I watched it again and went, oh, they did the color gag, and I've already <laughs> seen this once. Damn! <laughs> So it's perception. It's the content. It's the watching of what they're doing. It's the it's the show, right? You know, um, and again, anyone who went to Infocom this year, if they went, if they saw Penn and Teller, there's no oh, better. Penn, were Penn and Teller at Infocom? Yeah. Oh man, my favorite, my favorite magicians. Uh, yes, and and what they understand is how to remove what you're not noticing, and it may be the chair you think you're leaning on. <laughs> watching them i mean I, I think we could improve our mpeg encoding by watching magicians because <laughs> it's really studying human nature it's great that is great oh speaking of which let me just quickly uh recommend to you if you haven't seen this show yet called brain games have you seen that yet uh i'm brain trying to remember what what channel it's on what uh uh is it discovery I can't remember now. Somebody in the chat room, help me out. Uh, this show called Brain Games, where they they do a lot of Penn and Teller like things. Not it, it, it's it's more to as an educational thing than an entertainment thing, but it's also very entertaining uh, with a lot of illusions that they demonstrate and explain how they work. And context is everything. What are you paying attention to, and what are you not paying attention to? All those sorts of things that you're just talking about here are. Uh, are illustrated very well on this show. So if you haven't seen it yet, I do recommend it. I've been enjoying it quite a bit. Science Channel, thank you, Undermind. It's on the Science Channel. Of course, makes total sense. Well, yeah. Uh, anyway, food. it's not on the Food Channel, right. Uh, one more question about frame rates, though. Uh, did you see The Hobbit at the higher frame rate? Yeah. What'd you so, think? Um, I saw it. At an unknown, because it wasn't it, a, a very bad, I never could figure out one of the showings I saw it. I saw it in 3D. I saw it at a high frame rate. Which had I to be at, at 3D because that's the only way they showed at the high frame rate. The marketing of, how I, of what I was watching was very confusing at the theaters. What I kept thinking of was the Donkey Kong video game where they're all on the little ladders and there's a big monkey running around and fireballs are everywhere and they're coming down stuff. And I had no sense of film. I had a sense of activity merging with the smoothness of video. I'm biased. I like film. I like the mm -hmm. look of film. I like the motion of film. It's part of the creative process. And like brush strokes are part of paint and the palette and how light works and picking your film stock as part of taking pictures, film is a medium. So to remove one aspect of it, to smooth it out, I, I couldn't get over that. And I think it decreased my enjoyment of the movie. It kept making me think I was watching a video game. Mm, mm, interesting. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm a film guy. And I, 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 it, it, as, a, as an experiment of technology and a visual explosion, oh, yeah, it was there. Yeah. So do you I actually would, prefer watching film over digital projection? Yes. Absolutely. Really? Wow. Digital projection, when done correctly can be somewhat indistinguishable. Having a bunch of people who are trying to sell popcorn, try to make a technology indistinguishable from what it's replacing, eh, I don't go with it. I catch all kinds of problems, whether hmm. it's um, lack of focus because it's a digital thing no one cares about. It's just up in the room. It, it, there's an art to, to film, and I appreciate that. We have a, a, the community I live in has a little theater, and I love going there. I watched, um, oh, I watched some movie, uh, 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 Mel Brooks. Uh, I watched Blazing Saddles a little while ago there. It's like, mm. wow, that is cool. But uh, I, I understand what you're saying about film being an art, and it requires an artist in the form of a projectionist to get it right. 
but it's also fraught with its own set of problems, which I tend to see more easily than I do the digital projection problems. For example, film judder, right? Yep. Where, it, where it looks a little, a, just a little juddery because this film is being pulled through a projector. Uh, the real change markers every 20 minutes. You know, I can't not see them. It really bugs me. Um, yeah. I just love the rock solidity, if you will, of, of the digital projection. Uh, but I understand your point too, you know, to each their own, as they say. And and I also, when you see the little holes pop up and you see some weird cut and you see things move and you see the, the, the ramifications of a physical medium being deteriorated over time. Yes. But the dirt and scratches media, and dust and stuff. Yep. But the digital medium can also be deteriorated, not necessarily over time, but over ignorance. And that's where I see, I mean, if the film breaks, it doesn't work. You have to fix it. Right. And if the digital stream is having a problem or the bulb is going dim or someone put chewing gum on the lens, there's nothing in that process that says, hey, dude, fix it. Right. So, and the fact that digi in digital cinemas, there isn't a projectionist. There isn't somebody up there in the booth. So right. if something goes wrong, you know, there's nobody there to fix it. So I recognize that problem, too. By the way, Brain Games, I, uh, I think, was incorrect, undermined. It's not on Science Channel, maybe there too, but I've seen it on National Geographic Channel, which is kind of odd oh. to me. Um, huh. But but it is on National. I do remember now seeing it on uh, National Geographic. In fact, the host of Brain Games, I'm told by McTee in the chat room, was on Triangulation, another show on the Twit Network, uh, with Leo last week. So that's pretty cool. I'm going to have to go check out that one. Uh, well, we got a lot. Sorry, go yeah. ahead. No, there was a show called, um, uh, was it Con Con Connections, I think? Um, oh, uh, many great. Years James ago. Burke. And James Burke. What you're, what you're describing makes me show. think of that. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Yes. It is definitely, um, that, that is definitely a really cool show. In fact, I would love to find that online. I wonder if Netflix has it. I'm going to have to go look. Um, well, listen, before we go on, and there's a lot more to talk yes. about. Uh, but before we go on, I do want to take a moment to thank our sponsor for this episode, uh, which is Man Packs. Now, as a guy, and most of us here are guys, let's face it, uh, you know, we, we have to go shopping once in a while for basic supplies, underwear, socks, shaving stuff, toiletries of one sort or another. But who likes to do that? I sure don't. I don't even like going online and shopping for that kind of stuff. Well, manpacks.com makes that irrelevant. All you have to do is set up an account, tell them what you want, pick out from uh, their f array of really good stuff, uh, man approved, as they say. Uh, they even carry the underwear and socks that I wear. So, you know, it's uh, very easy to just go online, set up a, re a returning, repeating account uh, that uh, every three months you get a package in the mail. You don't have to do anything. And uh, it, it has all the stuff you need. You can change your order anytime. It's free shipping. Uh, and it, they make it really as, as convenient as possible, as painless as possible, really, to, uh, to go shopping and get the, the things that you need without having to worry about it. Uh, you know, there are thousands of guys already signed up, and it's uh, very easy to start, stop, change, do whatever you want. Every three months, you will get a package of whatever it is that you have ordered that you need and without thinking about it more than once. Now, for Twit listeners, there's a special offer. Uh, all you have to do is go to manpacks.com slash twit. You can get $10 off your first order of $30 or more or buy a $50 gift card for 40 bucks. So go to manpacks.com slash twit and get started today. And we thank Man Packs very much for their support of Home Theater Geeks and the entire Twit Network. So, um, Josh, one of the other things that you and I spoke about before the show that uh, was of importance uh, at the Infocom show was this whole concept of AV and IT convergence. Yes. Now, and what do you mean by that? Well, you actually said it in, in a beautiful way. You, 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 you paraphrased it. Um, TV show we talked about from a long time ago. I'll check to see if it's on Netflix. You made the jump. Ah, there you go. That's the now, convergence you're talking about. Well, that's the convergence from your point of your perspective as a content absorber. So if mm -hmm. the Netflix experience matches what you, ex what you want from the TV medium you're thinking about, you'll enjoy. 
If it's a geek fest, and can't push it from here and type in a number and set up some sort of DNS forwarding. Eh, you're going to wait for it on DVD. <laughs> the same thing as happens in the IT world. You know, where they're looking at the technologies they've had from printers or from, you know, uh, scanners, a fax machine. You know, how do they work with things? And what, what I've been figuring out is that if you don't, if you're in a professional world and you don't understand how something works with technology, you go to the geek who does. And that tends to be part of the IT department. For example, the geeks uh, on uh, this week in enterprise tech. Padre S.J., Father Robert Balliser and his uh, cohorts uh, talk about IT every week, and they've got a really large audience. So there are a lot of people out there who fit that description. Yep. Now, if you ask those guys what a router is, dollars to donuts, they'll talk about something having to do with packet structure and how things are moving and, you know, different types and QoS. If you ask an AV guy what a router is, he'll tell you it's a device that takes signals and switches it from one place to another, like an 8x8 video router, you know, a switcher. Mm -hmm. Kind of the same, same word, totally wrong piece of equipment if you screw it up. So how the worlds are combining based on what the people have as goals, the customers, their clients, they're not sure whether you use traditional IP topologies or terminologies or equipment or IT based. And each of those industries have different expectations of the equipment and the support systems. Mm -hmm. uh, the IT world is very strong into classes and certifications and uh, accomplishments and trainings. And AV, al although we try to work with, you know, with uh, uh, CEDIA and with education and with you know, the ICIA, pretty much you get thrown in the water and you sink or swim. You know, you, you figure it out. Um, or you don't. Or you don't, <laughs> in which case, you're like, oh, crap, maybe we need to, like, quickly call extra on help. Help. The, the, one of the things I figured out between these two worlds is that the IT mentality has their source being the same, going to a different destination or a sink. Uh, they change a different type of printer to have a different type of output, but the signals going down are the same. Sorry, our, our, um, let me be, I did the backwards. So in the AV world, we have the signals the same and we change the destination. Size of projector, type of, of, of speaker, stereo, right. mono, number of speakers, but the signal's the same. So the right. effect Right, it's going to be a video signal from a Blu-ray or something, or it's going to be a, an audio signal from an AV receiver or whatever to, a, to some speakers from a power amp. It's, that's going to yep. be the same, yeah. Yep, and we change the effect or the environment with what we're putting it on or making the reproductions from. The but rendering the, system, in other words. The rendering system, yes, the, in the IT world, that idea isn't as solid. They change the signals to make the devices do different things. Like one printer that at one moment could print black and white and then print color. And another command would have it scan. And they expect that those devices can take commands and change their personalities. Um, I had one person ask me what the command was to change the pixel shape of a projector. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Aspect ratio. What? Is there a command to change the aspect ratio of the pixels? No. It's so fixed. It's fixed. And that misunderstanding of who's responsible for what is kind of, it's, it's fundamental in just how they work with their industries. Um, I had another person absolutely become flabbergasted that no one had ever told them there were different types of screens. The gain of a screen could Oh, a projection change. screen, you mean? Yep. They had continually been told just get a more powerful projector, powerful projector, powerful projector. And well, why don't you In order to get a brighter them? image is what, what they were probably trying to accomplish. Yes. Yes. Ex sorry. Yes. Exactly. I was like, well, why don't you get the right balance of screen projector environment and maybe a shade? And they were just <laughs> blown away that like no one ever suggested that to them. So once again, a the, holistic approach taking into account all of the variables rather mm -hmm. than simply focusing on one of them. And that's where, as the worlds combine, because IT is taking over the content delivery, it's taking over the business installation, which is affecting the products of all industries. IT mentality, fixing things with a keyboard based on a set of expectations, that's shifting how we're all going to be working with equipment. Um, Even in the it, consumer realm. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at, uh, at HDMI, it's more of a... AV-centric 
connection. DisplayPort is more of an IT centric. DisplayPort <laughs> kicks butt over HDMI. That's what I've heard many, many times. Many people say that, you know, if we wanted to transport 4K, for example, uh, you know, we should do it on DisplayPort because that it's already got the bandwidth. HDMI does not. Well, it does to a certain degree, but DisplayPort has a bunch more. Yep. Um, and yet my argument against it, not against DisplayPort per se, but against, um, you know, the expectation that we'll see a lot of it all through the consumer world is that HDMI is so deeply entrenched. It's everywhere. It's on every consumer product. DisplayPort's only on computer type products, as you say, the IT world, not in the AV world. Right. And in the IT world, they'll go, hmm, we need more bandwidth. I think we better put two additional routers there and some more cables. Yeah, that's going to play real well hanging off the back of a television. <laughs> <laughs> Especially so, with the spouse, <laughs> with more yeah. cables, the techno spaghetti behind the TV. Nah! Danger, danger, Will Robinson. No. Um, <laughs> but I think from AV, the AV perspective, I think we're better suited to know how to keep customers happy and to keep projects moving forward by finding a balance. Mm -hmm. Where the IT perspective seems to be very much wanting to upgrade equipment, increase headcount, find someone to have the fault fall to, see, move on. Um... Yeah, an AV person picks the lens, an IT person picks the megapixels of the body. <laughs> so we, we do hope to see some convergence between those two. Yeah, um, I, it, well, it, it's happening it's <laughs> like any rolling cluster. It's, it's, it's occurring. You know, Netflix is doing an incredible job of letting people take the little funny square connector and find enjoyment from it, not just email. And the fact that Netflix is doing their own content now. Wow, yes. that's a major development in getting us away from cam companies that have cameras to now companies that have servers. So right. there is convergence happening. Uh, but I think we all have to keep it in mind. And like the gentleman's question before about, you know, a, a frame rate, go, what a, do we need 60 hertz? What are we doing here? Why are we here? What's going on? Hello? <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, let me, let me see if there are any quest any more questions, uh, here in the chat room. Uh, Omega one alpha asks, does 2k, 4k or 1080p apply to the led TVs or are they not the same? The LCD TVs that have an led backlight. Uh, uh that's a good question. Now, that's, that's one of the things we need to clear up here, I think. So, um, as a rule, you want to acquire in the most number of pixels with the best quality. Then you process, edit, make creative decisions in the appropriate number of pixels bandwidth quality. You want to show it in the most efficient manner. For most environments that I've seen people have entertainment devices in, 1920, 1080 is enough pixels. Removing obstacles of noise, keeping quantization at a minimum, not having artifacts. 1920, 1080 can be presented with moving pictures at 100, 120 inches with enough contrast, and you'll love it. Static pictures are different. Um, and when you're dealing with a, like a video gaming situation where I know what I'm doing because I'm controlling it and I'm aware of every little thing and does the little parrot's beak turn purple in the corner, which means I have to shoot the monster here, then there's a lot more information and, and the game changes a little. But when you're in, in the sit-back... When you're in the sit-back mode, yeah. Yeah. Remember, your eye doesn't see resolution. It sees contrast and motion. So more pixels don't help, especially if they're moving. Right. Although you're bringing up video games, and that reminded me that there was a comment in the chat room earlier about how maybe 60 frames per second, a higher frame rate, would be, in fact, uh, useful and, and valuable in video game play. Yes. I, I absolutely. Um, one of the hidden secrets of video game development is that not all, not all objects and all elements of them are refreshed simultaneously. They've got a certain amount of processing power. They've got a certain amount of bandwidth. So they're going to move elements around to keep things that are prevalent in field of view and prevalent in appearance working correctly. So games aren't all really refreshing everything brand new at 60 hertz or mm. whatever they're supposed to be. But not, you don't want to have a loss of that through your cabling, your display. You don't want anything to remove things you care about. 
And that's where you got to sort of begin to go, okay, rather than take this arbitrary decision that everything has to be 60 hertz at 4K because that's what I want, I kind of advocate testing and trying and experimenting and seeing how it should work. Um, and we found that backing up on things that we thought were important don't always prove to be important. Uh, I, I think keeping the connection speed as, as fast as possible and DisplayPort is a beautiful connector for that. Mm -hmm. Be beautiful bus. A um, bus. I think a bu it's a bus. It's yeah. a packet bus, a little micro packet bus. The having your graphics card able to handle and reproduce and not bottleneck. Sure. Your display, that one, I, I'm, I haven't seen enough information about games to know that 30 hertz to 60 hertz is perceivably different in the experience of it. But then it's kind of brand new, and I'm sure I'll get lots of comments from my friends who are gaming freaks going, they're nuts, I can't be shooting people up on Mars if I can't see their refresh, and how's this working, and what's going on? <laughs> so, you know, from, from the innocence of not being a gamer, I can make statements of anything. I'm not yeah. Right, right, right. Well, I'm not a gamer either, so I'm, I'm not going to challenge you on that. Uh, but you did bring up uh, the bus, and, and something that you wanted to mention and undermined asked about in the chat room is, what about HD base T? So HD base T is a really, really, really cool idea. Um, in the home situation, it becomes, I don't know how much more prevalent than an HDMI connection. In the professional world, being able to put one easily terminatable coax, well, a, a, a Cat, Cat 6E, I think. Cat 6E, um, I think, yeah. To handle the control and the signal and the audio when you're going distances. You know, if you're going to wire up an arena, Dude, you don't want to run around trying to terminate fiber or make extenders and things. But in the home situation where a cable run could be, what, 20 meters, 10, 50 feet-ish, tops? Yeah, even well, from, from, one, from one end of a normal-sized house to another, it might be along those lines. It could be in the 100-foot range. Could be. In a larger house. At, at that level, why do you want to send uncompressed signals? Why not just use a network? So... If your network is through the house, you're decoding what you're having through the network. Again, it's, it's, it's the right methodologies and the mediums for that environment. Mm -hmm. For the professional world, absolutely. Uh, HD base T is making a very strong presence. Um, and I think it's going to give the idea of discrete wiring and goofy but interconnection panels. It, it's going to be one more straw towards category cable being useful at lots of mediums. Mm. Not totally sold on it yet in home except for like center hung projectors or environments where you really don't want to be running things in pool tv uh, <laughs> yeah that's what i want to be doing watching tv underwater well sending power over that cable is an interesting idea too because as long well, as you stay 60 volts you could power smaller devices and send signaling and control all through a cat cable and that could lead to some interesting new applications like in pool TV. Like in pool TV. Um, uh, uh, Omega One Alpha cleared up his uh, his point here. He said when he was when asking about 2K, 4K, 1080p apply to LED TVs, mm -hmm. or are they not the same? He was referring to those to the direct view LED displays that we oh. were talking about at the beginning of the show. Okay, 2K, 4K. Um, generally, the number of pixels in a direct view is less than the number of, the, the number of pixels you see is generally less or equal to the number of pixels of the signal. Because the pixel pitch, which is constant in the display and the signal type, you'd have to change your size of screen to match the signal to keep a one-to-one. -one. So for the most part, you have more pixels in your signal than you do in your display. Well, that's not uh, true at home, is it? I mean, on a, yeah, out, coming out of a Blu-ray player, you've got a fixed number of pixels and what you want but, is a one-to-one -one relationship between the pixels in the signal and the pixels on the screen. I'm, what we, I don't know that we always want to put one-to-one -one re relationship as the holy grail. I think really? we need to keep, I keep. I think that's something that we have to keep in mind. But uh, a good good friend of ours, Tom Norton, you know, he he was the first to bring it up to me. It's like you know, maybe some adjustment isn't bad. If what you're doing improves the perception of what you're watching, is it good or bad to stay away from pure, to, to vary? 
Uh, in mastering, in working with content for production, absolutely. Take artifacts out. But if you need to do something with a frame rate or a resolution to make a particular medium look better, okay. The goal is the picture and how it looks or the sound and how it's heard. If, if your signal is of, uh, in audio, if you have a minor, if you have a somewhat compressed bandwidth of signal and you want to put speakers in that kind of blow it out a little bit, okay. People like it. They dance. They run around. They give the DJ more money. <laughs> So um, his question is well taken. I, I think it is a goal to be thought about, which is a one-to-one -one relationship of signal to display or from acquisition through signaling to display. But I think that should be a concept, not a, not a fact of law. Mm. Uh, it, to put it as a fact of law, I think kind of ignores a lot of what we as humans do with signals we perceive. We're not really seeing the pixels. We're not really hearing all the frequencies. I mean, the picture is in here, so is the sound. So these things and these things are only tools to receive them. True and enough. And that's a point that uh, Brain Games has made more than once. Uh, you know, that m movies and video, TV and so on is actually a series of still images. Yeah. But we don't perceive it that way. And the when the perception, when the when the artifacts of the mediums, whether they be pixels, frame rates, bandwidth, uh, uh, res, you know, uh, 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 a dynamic range, quantizations, when they introduce artifacts that are noticeable, then we've gone too far. But right. overproducing things that are not necessary for accurate reproduction isn't always a, a gain. Um, unless what you want to do is just have the biggest thing that's out there, which is okay too. Make your boat no. wider, push the piano down it. <laughs> or as I saw on one extreme yachts show recently, uh, you know, the guy wanted a helipad on his yacht. So he just made it 50 feet longer. Right. Cost him millions of dollars, but you know, who cares? <laughs> yeah, I like the guys who golf off the back of the, of the, the boats. That's just fun as hell. It's like golf. Right. And they got a bunch of people sitting out there on boats dressed in fancy white suits getting, I hope he doesn't hit me this time. <laughs> um, his question is very, is very valid though because when you have less pixels both in source transmission and display each one becomes more critical as you get more and more and more and our processing gets much better and our displays are much brighter and our attention spans are much different where are we producing where are we holding the line on things that may not really have value or not as much value it's a great and, question, actually. Uh, you know, as as we've been talking on this whole show about thinking about things in a more holistic way, taking a look at more than one parameter mm -hmm. and deciding at what point, where's the threshold of perceptibility, if you will, right. or of annoyance at the worst? <laughs> camera lens, camera body. I mean, right. I, I my, my camera body has got an enormous number of pixels and a big image sensor. And in hindsight, I wish I had gotten a smaller one because I could have had so much more fun with lenses. Now I've got to get lenses that handle the big camera body and they're better, but, but they're more expensive, that, but they're more expensive. And I'm saying, I really wish I had a bunch of goofy ass macros and fish eyes and things because I'm learning that would have been more fun to play with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's, well, it's what, balance. It's balance. I think everything we're talking about here is balance. Well, let me ask you one more question then. We're almost out of time, uh, which is uh, if, if whatever you saw at Infocom or just your own thoughts about wireless AV connectivity. I mean, there are two or three different uh, yeah. wireless quote unquote <laughs> HDMI specs, which uh, ne neither of them want to be called wireless HDMI. They can't be, in fact, legally uh, because they're not licensed by the HDMI Licensing Association, but we okay, have so them. And, okay, and what, what's, what's the deal? Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay. So um, <laughs> HDMI, the concept came from DBI or uh, uh, you know, DisplayPort. No, sorry, not DisplayPort. Uh, HDMI, DBI, and then what was the one before that? Pa panel link, where you take a VGA cable and then based on the frequency and the signals going down, let's just digitize it, clock moves. We have to make everything handle a wide range from VGA up to 1080p or 1920, 1200. So the cable, the signal medium has to be able to handle a wide spread of frequency. And what happens is, is that you have to be able to accommodate a large variance. 
Take wireless HDMI. You got to be able to handle someone who goes, I've got 10, 480p, I've got 1080p, I've got 720p, I'm at 50, I'm at 60. And trying to get them to change gears can be kind of hard. All the mm. systems that I've played with, once I stop changing frequency and pick one from source and from sync, all become much more stable. And that's a little secret I've been telling people. It's like, dude, set the set top box on 1080 or 720 or whatever you want, and you won't have as many problems as things change. Mm. The idea is very valid, um, but the obstacles because of the medium difference and the expectation of what they're trying to do, whether it's frequency change or someone turns on a phone or clicks a microwave or fires up, uh, you know, a, their 1934 Woody that has ignition that's just going <laughs> all over the place. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's wireless. So use it for what it needs to be or what it should be or what you can benefit. But just to sort of throw it against the wall and go, look, art. Eh. <laughs> um, with that, however, it is getting very useful. I think uh, the first time I was really sold on wireless was wireless subs, where cool, latency is not as important on sub channel, neither is dynamic range. I really don't want to run wires. Lovely. Um, I do a movies, I do a little outdoor projection here every couple of weekends, and I modulate the audio over an FM station and everyone tunes in with little radios and it's sort of great. sort of like drive-in theater yeah i care more about people not tripping on wires not pissing off neighbors and people mm -hmm. enjoying than absolute fidelity so it works in the application mm -hmm. and i think wireless hdmi or wireless connectivity needs to be applied where appropriate and not just looked at as oh this will work it's great let's upgrade windows 8 that's beautiful it's one better than seven we'll love life <laughs> Sorry, ours, ours go to 11. <laughs> ours, ours go to 11. Oh, yes. Oh, thank you. Beautiful. Ours go to 11. Oh, it goes to 11, eh? <laughs> well, uh, P Pete Putman uh, was at the show, of course, and uh, yep. he he was talking about, he taught several classes and he sent out an email, a summary thing, and uh, was talking about how uh, bandwidth has increased. He was able to show things from one end of the room to the other wirelessly very nicely and uh, nothing broke and nothing had a problem. So it, as far as he's concerned, it has come a long way and improved to the point where it's really starting to become useful. Yep. Agreed. Um, and a corollary I sort of have is that, um, let's call it eight years ago, 10 years ago, the idea of wireless connection for our computers or laptops, nada. We ran wires. Okay. Now we all run our laptops everywhere on wireless. But right. if you're trying to back up data or run something where there's a big payload happening, yeah, hook a wire up to your NAS. You'll like life more. Or, for um, example, if you're on Home Theater Geeks. Or if you're <laughs> wanting to make sure that we don't go, <laughs> and, and, and right. come staccato. So right. it, it is much better. And I think it's a better, I mean, in the, whether it's the professional world or it's the, I've got something I want to show to my friends here look, like Apple TV. Beautiful implementation. I mean, Apple TV is just great at saying, I've got a device, I'm going to make it appear on the screen, and we don't even have to think about what's connected. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. I do recommend that people, if they want to stream Netflix or uh, YouTube or Hulu or Vudu or any of those services uh, reliably, uh, especially in high def, that they really do want to hook it up with wires and not wireless at this point, Wi-Fi. And maybe take their Wi-Fi and actually change it off of channel six. What the heck, you know? What the heck, you know? <laughs> well, listen, Josh, thank you so much. It's been a great hour of uh, conversation with you just back from the Infocom trade show. But, of course, we've covered much more territory than that. And uh, I sure do look forward to having you back on the show another time. Absolutely. This is a lot of fun. And I got to show off my brand new um, acquisition of tastefully done test patterns. Oh, man, the, the test pattern suit. I have got to get me one of those. Cool. <laughs> well, listen, right, thanks again. Uh, sorry. Yeah. No, just have fun. And thanks. It was, it, was, it was fun to do this. Good deal. Thank you so much. Um, can I give them your uh, website? No. Okay. <laughs> I, don't, uh, uh, I just have fun helping people. I don't need more bandwidth okay. people. Uh, don't worry uh, about uh, it. I, all right. Uh, all right. Well, then uh, you'll just have to wait until Josh comes on the show again to uh, receive more of the wisdom of Josh Kairoff. Thank you so much for being here. You can find me, of course, at avsforum.com, and uh, you can email me at scott at twit.tv, and you can follow me on Twitter at htgeekscott.
Now, uh, you can also find previous episodes of Home Theater Geeks uh, right here at twit.tv slash htg and our relatively now new uh, YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash twit home theater geeks. Next week, my guest geek is scheduled to be Paul Hales, the founder of Pro Audio Technology, and he's got a very interesting approach to room correction for audio. So I'm really looking forward to that, and I do hope you will join me then. Until then, geek out. Geek out.